tonight on NJ Spotlight News, a state in mourning. Governor Murphy returns home speaking out for the first time after the unexpected passing of our late Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. Let us join together in memorializing the rock star we all cherished and the legacy she now leaves behind. Also on strike, 1,700 nurses walk off the job at RWJ University Hospital following failed contract negotiations. The nurses demanding higher pay and better staffing levels. We're tired, we're burnt out. We're, we're going and going all day, every day, all shift. You know, it's not getting breaks because you're too busy to take a break. Plus, segregation in schools. New Jersey's school system struggles to attract teachers with diverse backgrounds. A new report finds a widening gap in Newark. We're also seeing that the population of Latino students has grown at a rate that far outpaces Latino teachers in Newark. Plus, is AI taking over news next? As artificial intelligence technology develops, how will it affect the world of journalism and news gathering here in the state? These tools are not meant to generate truth. They are meant to predict and produce the most likely next word or set of words. NJ Spotlight News starts right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Friday. I'm Joanna Gagas, in for Brianna Venozzi. After the shocking and untimely death of New Jersey's Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver this past Tuesday, Governor Murphy made his first public appearance today after returning early from his trip to Italy. The governor holding a press conference to honor his former partner in politics, calling Oliver a trailblazer in every sense of the word and one of the finest public servants in New Jersey's history. Murphy also saying that asking her to be his running mate was the best decision he ever made. Senior political correspondent David Cruz has more on the governor's tribute to Sheila Oliver and the impact she's had on New Jersey. David joins us from the State House. David. Joanna, it's become apparent over the last few days just how powerful an impact Sheila Oliver had across this state, from cities like Newark and East Orange to Camden City, Trenton City, and even Atlantic City. They are mourning a powerhouse. Today, the governor spoke to the press for the first time since Oliver's death this week. Personally speaking, Tammy and I, along with our four children, are devastated. From the day Sheila agreed to join me in our first campaign in 2017, I have relied on her counsel, her compassion, and her courage at every single turn. And during our past six years of partnership, and it was, by the way, almost six years to the day, she had become an honorary member of the family. We posted uh, after her passing, I think Tuesday, late in the day, a photograph from the night that we introduced Sheila to our kids, a magical evening in the East Ward in Newark. And it's a night we'll never forget. She became to them almost like an aunt, and she was a sister to Tammy and me. Sheila was a trailblazer in every sense of the word. Over her more than five decades in public service, she made history again and again as the first black woman to serve as Speaker of the General Assembly, as the first woman of color elected to statewide office in our state's history, and as the highest ranking black woman to ever serve the people of New Jersey. But above all, Sheila was the pride and joy of Essex County. Oliver will lay in state here at the Rotunda on Thursday and then on Friday at the Essex County Courthouse, a rare honor for a public figure that speaks to her historic career. As governor, I relied on Sheila to shape our administration's policies on revitalizing our cities, expanding affordable housing, 
supporting our neighbors in need, and so much more. And I relied on Sheila not only because of her expertise and brilliance, but because she brought her lived experience to the table, both as a child of Newark and as a longtime resident of East Orange. She was an inspiration, an icon, and an irreplaceable friend, confidant, and leader. And if you look at her resume, uh, she's almost, if not singular, in public service at all levels of government in an uncanny way, at the community level, at the county level, uh, in the legislature, in a variety of capacities, Board of Education, as I recall, in East Orange. I mean, it's just one thing after another. Murphy deferred to the family on the cause of death, but said that Oliver was able to discharge her duties until she was hospitalized on Monday. The governor has until September 15th to choose a replacement. He said today that that process won't begin until after the funeral, which is scheduled for next Saturday. In Trenton, I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Thanks, David. Well, in New Brunswick, 1,700 nurses are on strike walking out of RWJ University Hospital early this morning. The union nurses blaming staffing levels and a lack of paid sick days as the key points in their failed negotiations with the hospital. And as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, they say they're fighting for the safety of themselves and their patients, even though the hospital system, which is an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News, calls the move extreme that serves no one's best interest. They walked off their jobs at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and onto picket lines across the street in New Brunswick. For the first time in 17 years, nurses here went on strike, about 1,700 of them, demanding better staffing at the level one trauma center that sees 3 million patients a year. We're tired, we're burnt out, we're, we're going and going all day, every day, all shit. You know, it's not getting breaks because you're too busy to take a break. When the ICUs are more critical patients, they require a lot of attention, a lot of care. So when the ICUs are short staffed, it's really profound. It's bad, it's bad, it's impossible. We're not being respected and we're, we're working unsafely most shifts. Veteran NICU nurse Linda Jenny says their attention's divided amongst too many tasks instead of focused solely on fragile babies. One patient's mom complained. Oh, and she's like, can you keep your eyes on my baby? So that's very hard for us to, you know, explain to the parents, oh, sorry, we have way more roles than just taking care of your baby. We are the nurses! We are the nurses! The mighty, mighty nurses! The mighty, mighty nurses! Contract negotiations started in April in the face of a nationwide post-pandemic nursing shortage. Jersey needs 14,000 more nurses, and the hospitals hired 150 new nurses since 2022. The problem we have in healthcare right now is that we have a crisis. A staffing crisis is a healthcare crisis. The hospital's made three contract offers and says it's willing to go to arbitration. In a statement, it said that these nurses are the highest paid in New Jersey and that they work at a facility that's among the highest staffed in the state. We're deeply disappointed that the unions decided to take this extreme action, the hospital stated, adding its latest offer addressed staffing concerns and provides a $20 dollar an hour bonus for nurses should the hospital fall below agreed upon standards. The union, United Steelworkers 4200, voted down the first two offers and hasn't replied to the third one, said President Judy Donella. The third proposal kind of mirrors the second one. There was a little bit of a change, but it mirrors the second one. So that's why um, we had had multiple membership meetings. The members did not want to vote on it again. The union's looking for staffing standards similar to deals recently negotiated by nurses at New York's Mount Sinai and Montefiore. RWJ's offered a 15.6% raise over three years, but its last staffing offer also imposes a penalty if nurses call out sick. That's a non-starter. Getting the local union leadership together to have a, a conversation about it and kind of plot out our, our strategy for the next couple of days here. While nurses picket, the hospital's continuing patient care without interruption, not with medical students, but with replacement nurses. I know people call them scabs and don't like them, 
but they're going to allow us to do what we need to do, and they're going to have to do what they have to do. No word on when negotiations will resume. In New Brunswick, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Former Governor Chris Christie was in Ukraine today in a surprise trip where the Republican presidential hopeful met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Christie indicating his support for Ukraine, saying he would send F-16 fighter jets and criticizing President Biden for not sending them, accusing him of not doing enough to support Ukraine. Christie was seen touring a number of war-torn locations around the country, including Bucha, to visit the site of a mass grave. The visit comes as the former governor is trying to distinguish himself amidst a crowded Republican field where he says his low poll numbers don't tell the whole story of his standing among Republicans. Christie's Ukraine trip follows former Vice President Mike Pence's visit in June. The Election Transparency Act signed into law in April is already taking effect, and it feels anything but transparent. The law doubles the limits for campaign contributions, does away with pay-to-play laws, and cuts the statute of limitations for campaign finance violations from 10 years to two. That last change leading ELEC, the Election Law Enforcement Commission, to dismiss 107 campaign co finance complaints including a three-count complaint against the Democratic State Committee and a two-count complaint against the Republican State Committee. Complaints were also dropped against the Senate Democratic Majority and the Democratic Assembly Campaign Committees. All the while, money's rolling in a combined $3.6 million as contribution limits for those committees were tripled from $25,000 up to $75,000 per donor. Having a diverse teaching staff that reflects the school's population leads to better educational outcomes. Even though studies show this, many states, including New Jersey, have failed to attract teachers of color. A new report from Chalkbeat finds in Newark, black and Latino students make up 90 percent of the school's population, but black and Latino teachers make up just over half of the staff. And across the state, it's even worse. Department of Education data shows that Hispanic students make up 33 percent of the population, yet have 8 percent of teaching staff, while white teachers make up 82 percent of staff. Chalkbeat reporter Jesse Gomez recently sat down with Brianna Venosi to talk about these numbers and segregation in New Jersey's schools, a matter that's before the state's superior court now. Jesse, it's good to see you again. It's interesting that you chose the state's largest school district, um, also uh, a pretty diverse district. What overall did you find about the disparities between the staff and the students? So it's 2023 and schools across New Jersey, including Newark, are still figuring out how to diversify their student body. Um, so after analyzing student and teacher demographics and student teacher data, um, we found that schools in Newark are pretty much split down the middle, serving mostly black and Latino students, again, mostly black or mostly Latino students. Um, but again, the racial and cultural makeup of those teachers varies. Um, so other cities, you know, across New Jersey, as they grapple through this, they may not have the same demographics as Newark, but, you know, throughout Newark schools, there's uh, roughly about, um, there's roughly, there's majority white teachers. So roughly 20% of Newark schools have a majority white teachers. And again, other cities in New Jersey have even lower proportions. Um, now, Black and Latino students, Black and Latino teachers account for just about half of the staff in Newark public schools. But we're also seeing that the population of Latino students has grown at a rate that far outpaces Latino teachers in Newark. So when they have that underrepresentation, what do we know about how it impacts, you know, relationships between students and teachers, which we know can be invaluable throughout a student's life, but also, you know, their scores, their grades, and their ability to um, place in college, in uh, AP courses, things like that? Yeah, so experts have said that having teachers that represent the racial and cultural makeup of students is beneficial. And it's also just one component of creating um, what we call healthy schools or better learning environments for students. And although it's just one component of that, um, research has shown that it leads to better attendance, uh, better student performance, and it just overall motivates students to stay in class. Um, now, I spoke for the story. I spoke with a Newark Public Schools alum. Her name is Melissa. 
Melissa, and she's actually pursuing teaching. Um, her parents immigrated from Brazil in the 1990s, and I asked her what were some of the challenges she faced, and she said her parents, who mostly spoke Portuguese, really found it hard to navigate the public school system, um, but she vividly remembers her second grade teacher, who was one of the few teachers she encountered that actually spoke Portuguese and was able to communicate with her parents, have a relationship with them, keep them up to date on her you know, progress. And that was a, a big burden taken off of Melissa's shoulders because at the time she had to be the one kind of you know, uh, translating for her parents and relaying the school information to her parents in her native language. So again, not only does it help in the classroom, but it also helps just overall relationships between teachers, families, and the school. Wow, pretty powerful too that that's impacted the trajectory of her life, that she's now going to go into that profession. Very quickly, though, because in a district like Newark, where things like attendance and student performance have been a, a real struggle, um, what's being done then to retain and attract, recruit these teachers uh, when we know that there's a correlation between? Yeah, so currently in Newark, you know, since it returned its local control, um, it was previously under state control for the last 25 years, um, it's, it's made really big strides in creating partnerships that allow these sort of pipelines from student uh, to the teaching profession. Jesse Gomez, really great reporting. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks so much. Check out Jesse's full article and the entire segregated series that includes reporting from a dozen other newsrooms across the state by heading over to njspotlightnews.org. New Jersey's full of important and compelling American history, including many Revolutionary War battle sites. But in Upper Freehold, residents are mounting a fight of their own to protect a piece of that American history, the environment, and their health. They're trying to stop a proposed warehouse from being built on a Revolutionary War site. Ted Goldberg spoke to people at the protest and inside a committee meeting about what they're doing to try to keep this warehouse out of their community. It's a sham for the people who are like, rah, rah, American Revolution, and then you did nothing in your own town to preserve it. You're hypocrites. The possibility of a warehouse in Upper Freehold has locals up in arms. Much like George Washington's soldiers when they pursued British troops here nearly 250 years ago. Washington and his newly trained troops are leaving Valley Forge, and he decided to trail them, but he couldn't get too far east because then he would have been concerned about being outflanked. And there's accounts of them firing at the British as they marched, and then after they encamped, they attacked them here. That skirmishing led to the more well-known Battle of Monmouth a few days later. People who live here say putting a warehouse on historic land wouldn't just be an affront to history, it would mean a much more polluted community. They're talking about 108 uh, loading docks. That will generate, by conservative estimates, of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, 2,500 tons of pollutants into this community per year. Residents like Sue Kozel say leaders haven't taken the necessary steps to protect this land from development. Clearly there's a problem with the five people on the township committee. And tonight's about holding them accountable. You have to open your mouths and tell us before the planning board meeting why you will not take any proactive steps. Kozel and others stopped by an Upper Freehold Township Committee meeting last night to air their grievances about the proposal. Since it wasn't a planning board meeting, a committee member and the mayor had to step out before public comment, since they're either on the planning board or have close family there. Township Attorney Dennis Collins gave a warning before public comments started. You may be creating a situation where you're helping the developer get something that he may not otherwise get. Collins confirmed that a warehouse application has been filed with the planning board. He also said that if a current committee member heard testimony and then joined the planning board next year, they might be disqualified from voting on any warehouse proposal there. That would give the developer a, a significant ground, if he's not happy with any result, to say that the process has been completely tainted. It's kind of like if we were suing each other and I got to talk to the judge without you being here to hear what I say to the judge. That being said, people still let out their feelings. The traffic congestion, number one, in and around Upper Freehold is going to be horrible under this. I'm just, I'm not asking you to respond, wink, or do anything else tonight. The proposal is about to destroy our property values. That beeping noise, that shrill beep, 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 beep. 
I don't care high, how, high, how high of a berm they build, what they do to, to soften the sound. You're going to be hearing that all night. It's nuts. I moved here and the first thing we said, wouldn't this be great if this farm stayed a farm until our kids were older? It's going to affect not just my house, but everyone's. They're not virtually in our backyard. They're literally in our backyard. If leaders don't buy the land, residents tell me they have other options. People say they've seen bald eagles around the area of where the warehouse would go. And if a bald eagle nest is found on the property, federal laws could gum up the works for putting a warehouse there. In Upper Freehold, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. The July jobs report is in and the numbers held steady. 187,000 jobs added last month and the unemployment rate at 3.5% just a bit better than projected. Here's how the markets reacted to the news. AI technology is improving every day, and while it offers loads of promise, some see it as a threat to jobs that have been held by humans. Well, those concerns may be coming to this industry, journalism and news media. AI-generated news is an emerging field that brings with it both convenience and concern. I'm joined now by Joe Amditas, Assistant Director of Products and Events at the Center for Cooperative Media, who looks at the pros and cons of AI news technology. Joe, thanks so much for being here with us today. There's an emerging field right now of AI reporting journalism that's happening, a company called Local Lens right here in the state. How does this reporting work? Well, so if you want to call it reporting, you can. Um, but essentially what's happening is these large language models, these bots, these chat bots, uh, are scraping public meeting transcripts, a lot of them you know, streamed on YouTube, uh, or they're scraping PDFs and public records, and they're generating summaries and you know, key takeaway points and things like that with some variations depending on which outlet is employing them. Um, and the goal is, at least as it's stated, is to provide a sort of starting point for reporters who may not know that a story even existed or that a conversation was had. Uh, and then they can search through these summaries to give themselves a better idea of where to go and what questions to ask and where to follow up. That's at least the purported uh, intent of them. So one of the things that's key in journalism we know is fact checking. What are the, some of the concerns as it relates to AI technology and bots writing news and, and that fact, check de, fact checking possibly not existing? Well, in the case of Local Lens, it doesn't exist at all. And I spoke with one of the co-founders yesterday about this and they do not edit the copy at all that the bots produce. They just run it on the site. Uh, if there's a complaint or you know someone wants to have them make a correction, they said they'll go in and do it if it's bad, um, which is probably the more one of the more egregious examples that we've seen of these kind of uh, tools being employed in the field of content and journalism specifically. Um, but I mean, essentially with any publication, if you are using these tools in an assistive capacity, for instance, helping you to sort of augment the work of your reporters, um, you're still held to the same standards, regardless of whether or not you get the text from a freelancer that you've worked with or haven't worked with, or you get it from a bot, you still have to be able to stand by everything that you publish as a journalist, as a news organization, as an editor. So at that level, nothing has really changed. It's just that these tools are not meant to generate truth. They are meant to predict and produce the most likely next word or set of words. And that is it. It's just glorified, you know, autocorrect and, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the next word is supposed to be. But is the average reader, viewer, consumer of this news, AI news, savvy enough to understand that? And you, as you said, it needs to be the reader sometimes who's calling out the errors. Well, in the case of Local Lens, yes, it's entirely on them. And they, they state that right at the bottom of the website. Everything on this website is generated by a computer. Um, but, you know, essentially, I don't want to I don't want to assume that the reader doesn't understand what's going on but I think what's more likely is that they just don't have time to investigate the veracity of every statement they read on the internet and that's been true before the bots came around and started doing this so ultimately not much has changed in that department
on the flip side of this, there is a need for more local political news coverage as we see news outlets shrinking. Where does AI fit in that space? Well, you got two parts of this. So on the one hand, these tools certainly can help journalists and reporters and editors focus less on the boring, monotonous, sort of everyday tasks that are, you know, just sort of automatable. Um, and hopefully the goal of using these tools will be to give them more time to focus on serving the communities that they cover. And that is the ideal sort of utopian, you know, expectation. But of course, you know, when you work for a for-profit company and the person in charge of that for-profit company or people in charge see that more as a cost-cutting and cost-saving measure, we've seen this before. It's just going to end up being another do more with less kind of situation. And that is what has most journalists concerned. Yeah. A lot to talk about. Joe M. Dita, Center for Cooperative Media. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. That's going to do it for us tonight. But a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Joanna Gagas. For all of us here at NJ Spotlight News, thanks for being with us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability equity, and economic empowerment, investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.